Hey, she's here with a cup of tea. Hurrah! Can I have one? Do you want a homemade cookie? Do you want a homemade cookie? I left my fridge door open and it's beeping. Do you want to go deal with it? Would you mind awfully if I go yeah. and close? That's an exciting bit of actuality. We'll keep that in. Hang on. Do you want me to go and get my dad? Hang on. Yes. There he is. That's a nice box. Hello, I'm Louis Theroux. Earlier this year, at the height of lockdown, I was invited by BBC Sounds and Radio 4 to record a podcast. God damn it, Louis. You're doing your thing. <laughs> Sorry, I had all of this yesterday and we were supposed to do this f thing. <laughs> I decided to reach out and interview 10 people I'd always wanted to speak to. Hello. Morning, love. How are you? Doing it remotely <laughs> via the internet and asking them to record their side of the conversation on their phones. My boyfriend needs his computer back. That's how you say... Oh. <laughs> the result was grounded with Louis Theroux. I'm with the big man. This is the boss. I'm just an additional piece of this. Ten conversations dedicated to connecting in dark times. <laughs> oh, you never know. These are a few highlights. <laughs> and it's... Oh, boy. What am I going to do now? Hi, Rose. How are you? Hello, Louis. How nice are to you? Meet you? How are you doing, Lenny? I'm doing all right. I'm going mad slightly. It's an honour to meet you, man. <laughs> Thank you, and likewise. Thank you very much for asking me, because I'm, I mean, I told a couple of my good friends, and they were like, oh my gosh, what have you done wrong? Have you done something wrong? Is it one of those weird documentary series? And I went, no, I think it's just a chat. So am I right in thinking you're in Mexico? I am. I am between a jungle and a beach. But there's sheep and stuff. Sheep and grass and trees. We're already live. This is beaming out to millions. Oh. It isn't. It isn't beaming out to millions. <laughs> hey, Wilson Green. Oh, you actually waved at me. <laughs> it's fun seeing people's rooms, isn't it? Are you having a nice tour of people's? A little bit. I'm trying to take the measure of your background. And we look at the boxes. You're in your messy room. <laughs> Do you know who I had my very first ever Skype conversation with? The first time I ever had, like, a video conversation with anyone. Who? Robbie Williams. That was back in the days when you were... You chased UFOs together, didn't you? That particular call was he wanted to spend a night in a haunted house and wanted me to facilitate it for him. So then I started emailing, um, like, ladies of the manor, saying, you know, dear lady, blah, I hear that if the portrait in your drawing room is moved... Uh, a ghost manifests itself. I have been contacted by the pop star Robbie Williams, who wants to spend a night in a haunted house, and I thought, like, no one would get back to me. 100% uh, of the people I emailed emailed back straight away to say that their uh, houses are definitely haunted and Robbie can spend the night whenever he wants to, so I got it all set up. And then Rob changed his mind and said he didn't want to oh, no. spend a night in a haunted house after That's all. awful. Uh, yeah, I thought, no wonder... Robbie Williams and ghosts get on so well, they both only manifest themselves when it suits them. Yeah, that's it, isn't it? And is how convenient that, uh, that ghosts are probably are more available to people, with to, to celebrities with cachet. You know, one suspects that a, a, a lesser booking might have failed to get so many ghosts turning up for them. I felt that they were, like, throwing their ghosts at Robbie as if they were their debutante daughters. Yeah, yeah, those... The ghosts are, it makes me think a bit less of ghosts, if I'm completely honest. How are you coping with the whole corona situation? How is your morale? I'm coping very badly. My morale is at almost rock bottom. I get my pleasures from contact with people. That is what I enjoy. And when I'm cut off from people, as I have to be at the moment, I don't do very well. I read, I watch television a lot. Um, I think a bit, but um, I wouldn't say that I'm having a very good time. It's been quite tiring, hasn't it? Don't you yeah, it's, it's absolutely exhausting. The amount of focus that you lose and also need. I feel it, it's a strange... And, and dark kind of privilege to live through something so historically extraordinary, something that I've never in my life, um, you know, I've never in my life been 
in, you know, there's never been a world war going on. I, I've never been conscious of being swept up. You know, you yeah. have to go back to things like the end of the Soviet bloc, the Berlin Wall coming down, maybe 9-11. These are grand historical events, right? Yeah, Italian Even 90. Italian 90, <laughs> Fleur versus Oasis, Mr. Blobby. Uh, Blobby Ma- when Blobby Mania yeah. swept, do you remember? These That's right. huge cultural tsunamis that just sweep people up. This is an uncharacteristic podcast for me because um, I've never interviewed a footballer before. And and in oh, fact, wow. okay, full disclosure, I hope this isn't going to make things awkward between us. <laughs> I don't know very much about football. No, but again, full disclosure, I really don't mind it. I class myself as a human being and as a... a, a partner and a father and then a footballer. So we were both at the same London public school. Yeah, for boys, right? I'm saying that because I, I'm not. I'm trying not to plug a school that uh, has extortionate fees. <laughs> well, we went to Hogwarts, basically, but it was... Um, it was Hogwarts in London. We had assembly in Westminster Abbey, which yeah. is extraordinary. I remember your brother, he was in the choir bit. I'm assuming you don't... Remember me? Uh, no, I'm sorry, but I do remember Marcel. Okay, you, you said that. You don't have to yeah. say it again. Yeah. I arrived in the sixth form at the point at which the girls arrived, with my voice still unbroken. Right. Yeah. How old were you? I, I would have been uh, probably fifteen, but a very yeah very young, young fifteen. 15 yeah. um, my testicles were descended, but utterly hairless. <laughs> The very last thing I did in civilization was uh, get my uh, certificate of citizenship. Am I talking to an American right now? A naturalized citizen, like like you. You're you're an American. You've citizen. gone John Lennon. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I'm an American by birth, um, and so I'm binational. But did you have to renounce your um, no your British citizenship? No, you don't need to do that. Is this so they stop calling you Welsh journalist John Ronson? That is always a little odd, because I, like, I did leave Cardiff when I was, like, 17. <laughs> if you want to meet members of the opposite sex, you've got to go to a place where they might be. And where they might be was to St Thomas's Disco next to the church, where you might hear the sweet or Gary Glitter or T-Rex or Motown, where girls would be. You spend nearly all evening ignoring them, and then in the last five minutes, there'll be this <laughs> this rush to the dance floor to try and get a slow dance with the girl. The slow dance phenomenon continued into into the uh, early eighties because I remember there would be dancing yeah, boys yeah. and girls, not really together, and then the designated snog track. What was your snog track? It was a tr- it was um it was by Hazel O'Connor. You drink your coffee. Was I it? Drink my tea. <laughs> I wonder who should go now, go now, go now. Oh, do you, I don't even know what it was I, called. It's from Breaking Glass. It's, it's from Breaking Glass. It's from the soundtrack of, do you remember from, that from one? a film called Black. I do, I remember it. For some reason. But our, that... our one was, hey, the lonely girl. Was, that, was, that was ours. That oh, was your three-minute window. Above. It was like, and it was a bit like um, musical chairs, where uh, it was a sort of frantic rush to, to grab someone, I mean, I don't want it to sound too assaultive. No, it but wasn't assaultive because yeah. the girls, the girls were, were waiting to be asked to dance all night, but the boys would try and cram the whole dancing with a girl thing into the last 10 minutes and hope they get a snog. I was not considered prime snog material. material. Think, yeah. <laughs> you were unsnoggable. But some girls didn't, wouldn't dance with me because I, was, I looked like me. You know, I was I was a black guy, but then then you'd see other How black guys. How would you know that? Out of interest, they'd that, say, that was, well, they'd that say would it, that would clarify it. I don't they would say, "I'm so." How would how would that be phrased? I don't well, date. Why would I dance? Or? Yeah, I'd, why would I? Why would I date? And they, why would I date a nignog or a darkie or something like that? Why would I dance with you? They'd say something like that. But thankfully, that wasn't the that wasn't the main thing. Often, people would dance with you. 
and be very, very kind. I had a lot of lovely kindness. I, there, there weren't very many that were horrible to, to me. My parents had saved up, or, you know, worked hard to put us in <laughs> private school. They wouldn't go to parties. They wouldn't, you know, spend money on pointless things. They would literally just save and save and save. And they put all their money into us. And, you know, they saw that the whole property market thing was booming at the time. And at that point, that's when they decided to take out a load of loans to try and buy as many properties as they could and then rent them out. But they were in like hundreds of thousands of pounds in debt, like just to get us into school. So when you got your A-levels, you said they lost their shit? Yes. <laughs> what were the results? I think it was like C, D, F and U. U is the famous unclassified, I think. Yeah. The- which so means you I did so that. badly they don't really know what to do with it. Is it? I never really knew what you meant. <laughs> I remember my my mum just screamed. My mum screamed. I like I've never seen her scream so loud. My dad just looked on the ground and he just didn't know what to say or do. He was just he was just like I, everything we've worked for has just come to nothing. So I, I don't know it was it was quite hard. Maybe some part of you realised that your heart was in YouTube, the YouTubing and not in the studies. You know what I mean? Maybe you, yeah. you'd made the decision. I decided, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to make them proud through the whole YouTube. <laughs> I'll make them proud. Like, at the end of the day, I, you know, as long as I can, you know, get rid of all their debts and make their lives comfortable, that's all that matters. So if we roll back the clock to the mid 90s when you are a successful, highly visible, highly sought after young actress. Did you feel at the time, were you enjoying that? I always found it deeply embarrassing. I found fame deeply embarrassing. I found being reacted to for something that wasn't me deeply embarrassing. I was mostly embarrassed most of the time. Uh, I didn't like people flocking around me or that kind of, it, it didn't give me a rush. It was the opposite for me. And I looked at it like I work at a bank this is my day job. It's just extraordinarily strange. Um, and I do strange things. Um, and unfortunately, for the longest part of my career, people, they don't know you. There was no, you know, online anything. There's no Instagram. There's no Facebook. There's no Twitter to speak for yourself, even in limited form. So the only thing the public got from you was how you were sold to the public. And I was sold by the studios and producers as a sex symbol. Um, and that's even ostracizes you further within kind of the Hollywood community, if you will, because most women think you're trying to steal their husband and most men think they have a right to touch you and it sets you up for a really crap existence. You came to be, as we know, victimized, right? But uh, you don't seem marked as the kind of person uh, who would fall foul of the glitzy and glamorous world of Hollywood. Everybody was nice to me, to my face in Hollywood. So I couldn't tell. And when you're famous, everyone's like like this, and you, or they're just fake nice to you. I never could tell. And then later I would have a friend go, oh, that new friend of yours has been really mean to me behind your back. But I didn't know if it was the old friend trying to get rid of the new friend, or in fact, the new friend was really a diabolical person because everybody puts on a face. And in Hollywood, it's almost impossible. So I had no idea who the bad players were. I had no good agent or manager that was like, these are the people to watch out for. I mean, literally my entire life has been like a wee roller coaster. I know that people say that all the time, but I'd have my great times and then suddenly I'd think I'm useless at everything. For the listeners who aren't fami- familiar with the story, you'd had some eating disorders. You had a breakup, you got divorced. Yeah, yeah. There's this fluctuating level of mental health. Yeah, absolutely. And um, there's an actual, there's a suicide attempt, I think. Oh, no, I I couldn't sleep. I hadn't slept because I was suffering from insomnia on top of everything else. And then I just kept taking paracetamols and I took some, like, um, sleeping tablets. And then I phoned my ex-husband and I said, you know what, I think I've overdone this. I don't want to die, but I just want to sleep. I just want to sleep. And so my phone was hacked at that time. So by the time I got to A&E, it was already in the press. So that was chalked up as a suicide attempt, but it, it, you don't think it really was? I didn't attempt at all. It's like, I just wanted to sleep. I was still going through just 
you know, just major depression and I couldn't figure out how to sleep. It was just, it just felt, it felt like never ending being awake and I just wanted to sleep. Around this time when you're dealing with mental health issues in a, in a kind of more full on way, your hair also falls out. <laughs> yeah, don't know why I'm laughing. As if you didn't have enough to it. deal with, right? <laughs> it's like, hey, how about, how'd you like this? How about we? How about your hair starts coming out in chunks? You, you know, it was like four weeks; it was all gone. But I remember going home to my mum's in Edinburgh because I'd been working in America, looking for um, dead people, and um, it was a program called Dead Famous. So we were looking for Frank Sinatra in um, a graveyard in Las Vegas. Looking for his ghost, if we want to be strictly accurate. Yeah, see, I'm not actually going to dig him up. No, I was thinking we were doing like a seance. And then bits of my hair started falling out. And my boyfriend was a cameraman and he was like, your hair's all falling out. I was like, oh, it'll be fine. Maybe it's hormonal or whatever. But then I went up to Edinburgh to see my mum and I had a hat on and I took my hat off. And the first thing she said was, I told you, if you mess with the dark side, they will take your hair. For me, it was definitely a crossroads in life. When I got sentenced to jail, I was in the championship with Watford. I was actually Watford's top goal scorer that year. So things were going, quote unquote, good, well. How much you can you say about the incident itself? It was a Tuesday, Tuesday night, and I'd kind of just like walked through a bit of a, a melee, and then someone just said, are your brothers in there? And I just steamed in. Um, hit anything that moved. I genuinely thought at that moment, put him down before he hurt you. That's all I thought. I just turned around and, and just and just kicked him in the face and that's that was the action I got sent down for. I was in uh, Winston Green Jail for a few weeks and a lot of the people in there I either grew up with or knew my dad. So I kind of went in there like I'll be all right. What happened when I was in the gym was that guys come up to me and literally went, if I didn't have so much respect for your dad, I would slap you all over the place right now. And I was kind of like, huh? Why? And they went, you, you're living everyone's dream and you f***ed it up to want to be tough on a night out. You're an embarrassment. A lot of people put me straight uh, with their words because, again, I thought I was the cool kid. Everyone would speak nicely to me and we'd kind of get along. But people just told me I was an idiot and that's what I needed. What strikes me is that, for you at least, that was maybe a moment to take stock and rebuild. And this wasn't like at the beginning of your career either. You, you were at Watford by this time. Yeah. Getting sentenced didn't change me. What changed me was going in and my my mum, I remember my mum speaking to my mum the day after and she was in just floods of tears. And I was like, well, what, what's happened? And she, my mum works for a network rail. So she went into the train station and, and the local paper, um, which is the Birmingham Mail, had a picture of me and my brother on the front of it and said, uh, footballer sentenced to jail kind of thing. And it was just plastered all over the local paper. And then she's walking into work and every and it was a free paper, so people kind of picked it up and everyone in her office was talking about it. She was just ashamed and I was like, I'm meant to be the one who protects you and I'm the one now embarrassing you. Right, so you had a bit of trouble because you asked sexually inappropriate, borderline harassive questions at a a gaming conference, saying things like, I don't know, what do you do when you're not fingering yourself was one of them. <laughs> and I think you apologised for it, did you? Yes. So I, uh, I've apologised several times uh, on numerous videos, uh, tweets, etc. And uh, yeah, it was just me as a kid. Like, you know, you've got to remember, I, as a kid, was brought into this world where I was just gaining an audience and the audience was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I would try things and, you know, certain things would do well. And it was a lot of time the edgy, edgy things that would do really, really well. And I was like, okay, I got to keep pushing it. I didn't care about these women. I was just like, oh, these are just, this is just a chance for me to get more views, etc. And I definitely messed up. Obviously now I regret it because, you know, I've now stepped back. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why I took a break into it 2017 to realise what I wanted in life and what I w wanted, you know, my name to be or what my brand to be of, like, it got to a point where I was just making content for the people and not for me. And I felt I needed to change that. I've been 
reading one of your books because you've written a couple of memoirs. It seems to me that you're 15 years old, but you've just struck up quite a deep relationship with a, a mysterious Italian man in his late yes. 30s, mm. right? The man in the Burberry Mac. <laughs> you, you met you on a it. bus or something? On a, on a tr- on the subway, yeah, on the train. On yeah. the underground, on the so underground. Were you, did you lose your virginity to him when you were 15? <laughs> Louis, we need some foreplay before we ask these kind of questions. <laughs> When I was younger, you know, my idea of what love was was quite traumatic. It was very sort of, you know, if he hits me with a chair, he loves me, you know, that kind of thing. So you were 15, but you didn't feel taken advantage of. No, I didn't because I was really clear about what I wanted. But I wouldn't say that that's true for everyone. You know, it was just my experience. And I think at the time, my parents uh, would have done anything to get hold of the, the guy and have him arrested because actually it was breaking the law. But, you know, I was involved in that choice. It wasn't something that was forced upon me. I don't look back and think, oh, I was traumatised. I think, you know, for the for four days I thought I was in love. <laughs> I'm not beautiful and probably not very attractive. But early in my life, I found the woman of my dreams, of my heart, who is the woman of my life. I haven't always been faithful, but I am now. And um, I'm just grateful that I got to that rock which has irradiated my happiness for the rest of my life. How old were you when you, when you met your partner? Well, I met, I met her in 1968. And I was born in 1941. Can you do the maths? You were born May 18th. I was born 1941. In I was born May 20th. Uh, I think that would. Mm, I'm going to say roughly tw- 27. I can't. I can't really. Something. I like think that. it's. I think it's 27. And I had had um, a lot of masturbation. Um, some cunnilingus, no penetration, and then came my partner, and everything was plain sailing. Very nice. I could do a whole separate show on <laughs> what uh, sex is like for lesbians. I mean, in <laughs> or just for Miriam Markley. <laughs> yes, or just for I, yeah, because one wouldn't want to make you representative for the entire lesbian. No, population. and I think that would be unfair because not all lesbians agree with me about things, you know. Lesbians apparently have better sex than straight women. Oh, without question. You think that's true? Why would that be the case? Because we sleep with uh, with our sex. And we know what to do with our, with our hands and our bodies. And men have only got a prick to deal with, poor souls. I can't imagine what it must be like. I mean, what happens to the balls? You know, when you're, if you're inside a woman, where do the balls go? Do you want an answer to that? Not really. <laughs> I interviewed Jimmy Savile and did two documentaries about him and I had heard rumours about him, but not in the industry, as a, more or less as a child growing up. Like, there were, the rumours were so well established that he was dodgy, that there was something sexually untoward about him, that it felt as though everyone had heard something which had the paradoxical effect of making you feel that it couldn't be true because actually... Um, if, so, if it was true, surely someone would have done something. And then later on, of course, having made a programme about him and having got to know him a little bit, and then when he's un- unmasked, it produces a sense of guilt because you feel that... You um, gave him a platform. Not so much you gave him... Well, that you failed to get to the truth, right? Right. Well, and, you did. Yeah. Sorry. You know, we used to have something of a, of a rivalry, or, 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 you know, I, I felt that towards the beginning in the 90s. I think I feel it more now, now that you're successful in America, I feel it a little more strongly. I think rivalry is one of those things that tends to be felt by the junior partner. It's like I'm very good at winning, but not good at losing. Right. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, because now when I watch your things and I and I'm really, you know, admire them, I just think, oh, you know, Louis did that brilliantly. But back in the 90s, maybe when you did all those really funny things at Aryan Nations, for instance, I did think that. I thought, oh, God, this is, this is, this is hurting me because Louis is doing this so well. My great um, story about Warren Beatty, which I have told before, but I'll tell you because it's I think it's a great story. When I went for the audition, my agent said, now he's he's very busy, so you'll have to go in the lunch hour to his trailer because he was filming at Twickenham at St. Margaret's Studios. So I knocked on the door of, the, of his trailer and he said, come, uh, come in. And I opened the door and he was sitting at his desk, um, you know, reading or something. And he looked me up and down, just up and down quite coolly. And then he said, do you? And I said, yes, but not you. And he said, oh, why is that? And I said, I'm a lesbian and I think girls. And he said, oh, can I watch? I read that you used to say when you went to auditions, uh, when you arrived, you would say that you would been bitten by a dog on the way there. That's true, sadly. Just for a for maybe a two, three-month period when I started off, what happens essentially in London particularly, and in New York, I'm sure, is that at the same time of the year, when the colleges finish, the city is swamped with these hundreds of wannabe actors, thousands probably. And so it's hard to make a name for yourself or to even make an impression. So I asked a guy who had left the previous year and picked up a couple of jobs on Holby City or something. I'm like, well, this guy's a storm and success. I need to get some advice. And I said, what do you do? Like in those meetings, because you take a lot of meetings that start with producers or casting directors just trying to have anybody take you on. And you'll do loads of them. And therefore, they're doing lots and lots of them. And he said, just make an impression any way you can. Doesn't need to be talent even. And so for, yeah, for around two months, I pretended that I had just been bitten by a dog as I walked in. And I would go in and say, ah, shit, oh, did anybody see that Cocker Spaniel on the road? There was, um, anyway, I'm fine. It didn't, it didn't, oh God. And then I'd be clutching my ankle. And it didn't, and I'd pull down my sock. And be like, it didn't, it didn't tear the skin. It's fine. It's fine. We're good. We're good. And uh, and then I kind of then we just get back to normal life. I don't know what I was hoping other than, other than like somebody would go, hey, you know who'd be good for that? The guy that was bitten by a dog. <laughs> but it all came crashing down. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> it all came crashing down when I took another one of these general meetings, and I'd taken a, a, dozens of them at this stage, and I went into this meeting. And they were like, hey, how are you? And I'm like, good, good. I just, oh my God, just at the bottom of your stairs. It was this, I don't know, he was like a terrier mix. Like he wouldn't have done any damage, but he went right for my ankle out of nowhere. <laughs> and, they, and they were like, oh my God, that's so weird. And I was like, I know. And they said, because the last time you were here, you were bitten by a dog. <laughs> I'd forgotten that I'd be <laughs> So... So I had to try and style it out. And I was like, yeah, I don't yet. Yeah, I've been having a lot of trouble with them lately. <laughs> I'm trying to change the subject. What's the part? What's the... <laughs> What's lunch going to look like? Are you going to make something for it, for yourself and Elaine? No, Elaine's out with the dog. I'm getting texts from Nancy. Yes. <laughs> Please, Lou, it's been three hours. <clears throat> it's really... Well, it no, she not. does exaggerate. She, no, she really hasn't. does exaggerate. I need a wee, so I, I, I should All right, go. lovely to talk to you, John. Speak to okay, you soon. Bye-bye. All right, okay. you guys, have a great Thank night. Thank you ever Thanks so again, much. Rose. Thanks again, Helena. Hope we cross paths again soon. Thanks so much I for doing this. Too. See you later, Louis. Stay Good safe. Luck. Good luck with Bye. everything. I'm going to send have my it. wife a message saying, nearly done. Is she getting fed up? She said, are you finished with two question marks? <laughs> And no kiss. So that's the giveaway. <laughs> Send her a kiss from me and see if that frightens her. To listen to these Radio 4 podcasts in full, search for Grounded with Louis Theroux on BBC Sounds. 
BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts.